we must confront our greatest hopes and most terrifying fears. Will human cloning fulfill our dreams of medical miracles? Or our nightmares of a world where science has gone mad? We will know soon enough, because this is the dawning of the clone age. From city to city, an incredible hysterical panic spreads. As the unimaginable becomes real, the impossible becomes true. It sounds like the scenario of a science fiction thriller, a new way of creating life. Human flesh and blood out of thin air is fantastically powerful. But now, many leading scientists believe it isn't a fantasy. Human cloning is only a matter of time. Cloning is or will be possible. The technology is virtually almost here, if not already. It wouldn't surprise me to find that it's already taken place. I think it's altogether likely that we will see private enterprises in cloning in the next few years. It's no longer science fiction. A series of developments in embryology and genetic engineering has put us within reach of this astonishing breakthrough. Who are you? I'm you, Mr. Knight. I'm your clone. Human cloning will take place, and it'll take place in my lifetime. And I don't fear it at all. I believe that human cloning is inevitable. I believe it will be tried, and I believe it will be done. I, unfortunately, I don't think it should be done. Like it or not, human cloning could change life as we know it. Imagine a world where we could bring back a deceased loved one, where women could reproduce without men, and where countless lives could be saved with spare body parts grown from your own cells. These are a few of the things that may happen if human cloning becomes a reality. Until now, most of our ideas about cloning humans have been lifted from the realm of science fiction. You stole my face, my car, my wallet, my clothes, and now my girl! Although the science in the 1974 film The Clones is far from accurate, it gets the most vital fact right. You were created from a gene taken from the lining of my stomach. A clone is an exact genetic duplicate engineered in a laboratory. Every cell in our bodies contains our own exclusive blueprint, known as DNA. Because a clone would have the same DNA, they would have the same genetic blueprint and would look just like us. Cloning experiments aren't new. They have been conducted and improved upon for many years. In 1952, researchers in Pennsylvania were already working with cloning technology. They were successful in cloning tadpole cells, but the tadpoles never matured. Thirty years later, Dr. Steen Willitson pioneered a technique that proved mammals could be cloned. By transplanting the nuclei from a developing embryo into donor egg cells, Willitson successfully created the first cloned animals. I was the first person who actually cloned mammals. However, the uh, cells that I used for cloning in those early experiments came not from adult or mature organisms, but rather the nuclei came from early embryos. So in my case, it was not adult cloning, it was embryo cloning. Cloning experiments continued with other animals, but went relatively unnoticed until February 22nd, 1997, when a little sheep named Dolly <coughs> captured the world's attention. Humans are not God and should therefore not try to play God. This new discovery raises the troubling prospect that it might someday be possible to clone human beings from our own genetic material. News of Dolly, the first clone of a fully grown animal, touched off a storm of controversy. People reacted so strongly to Dolly because I think down deep they understand that people aren't really that different from a sheep and that this could be us. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! 
It's an age-old story of human arrogance, a brilliant doctor hoping to create life. When this dead hand moves, the monster created by a man they called Mad is turned loose to strike terror into the hearts of men. As the story suggests, it may not matter how good scientific intentions are. Manipulating life flirts with disaster. Well, I think people do expect cloning to result in some Frankenstein-like synthetic beings. I don't see why that should be the case. People see too many bad movies. That's the problem. Science fiction author Robert Silverberg has explored many cloning scenarios in his short stories and novels. He believes that cloning opens up tremendous opportunities. I know I sound like Dr. Frankenstein myself when I say this, but I think it's important to distinguish between what is truly scary and menacing and what is simply useful. Since a clone would be an exact genetic copy, it would have the same DNA, blood type, organ composition, and bone marrow as its original. With this in mind, and the technology fast approaching, human cloning could be the cure for many patients with life-threatening illnesses. Get her right down here, look. Right here. Seven-year-old Jessica Lopez needs a miracle. She's been fighting leukemia since she was two, but her chemotherapy treatments are no longer working. She must receive a bone marrow transplant from a genetically similar donor to survive. When Jessica first got sick, my daughter and my husband and I were tested, but we weren't a match for her. And there's been bone marrow drives for a lot of children, including her, but there hasn't been a match. Jessica will have to rely on nature. Her mother, Leticia, is about to give birth. This is not a guaranteed solution. There is only a one in four chance that the baby's bone marrow will be a match for Jessica. Fortunately, the news is good. Jessica's baby brother, Reuben Jr., is a match, and Jessica will receive a bone marrow transplant. But this is not an alternative for everyone. For some, a clone may be the only answer. I, for example, have no siblings at all. How nice for me to generate one that I might be able to get bone marrow from 20 years from now. Still, others, such as Washington State Christian Coalition Director Jerry Shaw, see moral problems with such a solution. I think that's an improper reason to create a being. And I, I, I'm wondering what the consequences would be to a person growing up knowing that their only reason for creation was to provide spare parts. Cloning could be the answer to many of life's everyday problems. For example, who wouldn't want a little help around the house? I need you guys to help me. In the 1996 comedy, Multiplicity, Michael Keaton's character clones himself not once, but three times in an effort to balance his work and family life. Nobody, nobody has sex with my wife but me. Hey, talk to him. Fabulous role, Doug. A common misconception about cloning is perpetuated in multiplicity. Keaton's movie clones spring up fully grown overnight. In fact, a human clone would begin life as a baby. It'll take 13 or 14 years just to get your own clones through adolescence, and then you've got a bunch of adolescent clones of yourself running around the house. Would you want that? Oui. Multiplicity also fuels suspicion about cloning. Keaton's clones get him fired from his job hey, hey, hey. and have sex with his wife. Hey, we're not perfect. But we don't need to look to Hollywood to see how clones behave. They've been the subject of study for years. One out of every 120 people walking the earth today has a clone, better known as an identical twin. All twins are clones, but not all clones are twins. And the reason I say that is because what is a clone? It's a genetic replica of an organism. Dr. Nancy Siegel is the director of the Twins Studies Center at California State Fullerton. Okay, Tapata held up red and Tammy held up blue, so it's zero to five. Siegel contends 
any set of twins would be more similar in behavior than any set of clones would be. Born 20 years apart or even born 10 years apart or 5 years apart, it's much more likely that the clones would be different because they would be coming into the world at different points in time. So no, I would not expect the clones to be as alike as identical twins. And despite their many similarities, even identical twins are not alike in every way. There is no behavior or physical characteristic we can measure that shows perfect similarity. And what this teaches us is that the environment is having an effect in virtually every aspect of human development. So whether your clone turns out to be an evil twin or a good twin may have more to do with their upbringing than with your genes. With an understanding of how environment shapes our lives, cloning could make it possible to create the perfect human. Meet Dolly, the world's most famous clone. Here she is. You couldn't find a more unassuming creature to cause such a stir. But from the reaction to the news of her birth at Scotland's Roslyn Institute, you might have thought a monster had been unveiled. There was a story in, in one of the American magazines which suggested that uh, Dolly was a, a killer sheep and had attacked her keeper. It was uh, pure fantasy. You can see how friendly she is. Biologist Bill Ritchie is one of Dolly's creators. He is as close to a father figure as the little sheep will ever know. Dolly didn't have a real father because she didn't need one. She's an exact genetic copy of a six-year-old ewe, the first mammal ever created from the non-reproductive tissue of an adult animal. Dolly was cloned in a process called nuclear transplantation, or nuclear transfer. Their first step was to place an unfertilized sheep egg under the microscope. Using a hair-thin needle called a pipette, they punctured the cell's membrane, then sucked out the egg's nucleus and DNA. Next, a donor cell from a different U's udder was selected, then inserted into the egg cell that had its DNA removed. Ritchie then placed the egg with the donor nucleus between two tiny electrodes. And, much like the burst of energy when sperm fertilizes an egg, a gentle jolt of electricity jump-started the fused cell to begin growing a lamb embryo. After growing for six days, the lamb embryo was implanted in the uterus of a surrogate mother sheep. It grew to become Lamb 6 LLC, the little lamb that we now know as Dolly. But it wasn't the technique used to create Dolly that rocked the world of science. After all, reproductive biologists, using a similar technique, had cloned embryos a full decade before Dolly was born. The thing about Dolly is that she's the first animal to be produced by nuclear transfer from an adult cell. Dr. Ian Wilmot is the principal investigator for the team that created Dolly. He realized the distinction of whether the donor cell comes from an adult or an embryo is crucial. When scientists clone an embryo, they're duplicating an unborn creature, so they don't know what they're getting. But when scientists clone an adult, they're copying a known entity. Cloning adult animals would allow farmers to make copies of their woolliest sheep or champion cows, an option they didn't have until Dolly came along. I think that we probably believed a few years ago that it would become possible, but what none of us were sure of is exactly uh, when it would be possible, nor with what sort of frequency, with, nor with what sort of cell. And we still have a lot to learn about which cells it is possible to use from an adult. Prior to Dr. Wilmot's research, Many biologists thought it was impossible to clone from adult cells. As a cell matures, the DNA inside undergoes dramatic change. Cells specialize. Some become eye cells, while others may become part of a spine. Dr. 
Dr. Wilmoth's team figured out how to force an adult cell out of its normal growth cycle and back to its original unspecialized state. This cell could then access its complete genetic blueprint and create another animal, a clone of the original. This breakthrough was necessary for the Roslyn scientists to achieve their ultimate goal. They are looking for an affordable way to duplicate genetically altered animals. Called transgenics, these creatures carry genes from two different species. Here, human genes are injected into a one-cell sheep embryo. When the embryo matures, it's hoped that the newborn transgenic lamb will produce a human protein in its milk. By engineering the sheep's DNA in this way, scientists believe the animal's milk will help heal human diseases like cystic fibrosis and hemophilia. Patients would be able to receive their medicine by simply drinking the animal's milk. There will be some uh, diseases that we can provide a treatment for by making transgenic animals. I mean, the animal Polly, which was born here recently, will make in her milk a protein which can be provided to treat a, a human disease. A flock of transgenic sheep would produce all of the necessary clotting protein for the entire world's hemophiliacs, a worthwhile but expensive process. One report estimates that it can cost up to $4 million to create a transgenic animal while cloning that transgenic animal is far less expensive at only a quarter of the cost. If Dr. Wilmot and his colleagues have discovered a way to create a flock of super sheep through cloning, could we use the same method to create a race of superhumans? It's a bird, it's a plane, it's Superman! Some have suggested that cloning could be used to duplicate the best and brightest, strengthening the human species overall. By carefully choosing who we might copy, cloning could provide the means to create what some might envision as a perfect world. The idea of creating a superhuman race is not a new one. In the 1930s, Adolf Hitler sought to purify humanity by murdering millions who had what he considered undesirable traits. The past replaying itself is a chilling thought to Rabbi Elliot Dorf, professor of philosophy at the University of Judaism in Bel Air, California. In the case of cloning, the, the danger, at least the theoretical danger, is that um, some group of people will gain power and will decide to clone themselves. In the case of Hitler, it was blue-eyed, blonde-haired, Aryan kinds of people and uh, would want to populate the world with people like that and with no one else. He didn't succeed, thankfully. I say, I say thankfully not only because I'm Jewish, but also because I'm human. Variety is the spice of life, after all, as well as the way in which we preserve humanity on the Earth. What if Hitler himself were cloned? Would he continue his inhumane mission? There was a movie some years ago, The Boys from Brazil, which imagined that Hitler would have himself cloned. And I think that was, that's a lot of the fear that a number of us have. Right here, in this godforsaken place, I have created a scientific miracle. I have turned the whole world into a laboratory. In the 1978 film, Adolf Hitler's physician, Dr. Joseph Mengele, played by Gregory Peck, successfully clones 94 copies of the Fuhrer. The story correctly recognizes that creating an exact copy of a human being requires not only the same genetic structure, but also the same upbringing as the original. You are the living duplicate of the greatest man in history. Adolf Hitler. Oh man, you're weird. I think that the idea of raising a clone years later and expect them to be absolutely identical to the donor is quite improbable. As Dr. Siegel's studies of twins have shown, both nature and nurture play a role in shaping a personality. It would be virtually impossible to recreate the world environment that Hitler was born into. But even if we can't clone a dictator, the technology opens up another frightening possibility. 
What if human clones become nothing more than disposable spare part incubators?